Now, cerebellum might mean little brain, but it's hardly that. It actually has four times more neurons than the cerebral cortex does. And it's the central coordination center of the nervous system for the body. And it's connected to the brainstem by three peduncles. The inferior cerebellar peduncle, the middle cerebellar peduncle, and the superior cerebellar peduncle. And there's three on each side. So there's a pair of inferior cerebellar peduncles, a pair of middle, and a pair of superior, which directly connect the cerebellum to the brainstem. Now, visually, if you look at the cerebellum, especially in the lab, and you look at the superior surface, you'll see some features uh, that are outlined on this slide. There's an anterior lobe, and then there's a, the big primary fissure that you see there, and then there's a large posterior lobe. And in the middle is called the vermis, and you can see that better on another slide. If you look at the inferior surface, you can see, again, a large part of that is the posterior lobe. You can see in the middle, the vermis. And then there's two elevated areas that I've got the arrows pointing to the one side. It's the same on the other side. Those are called the cerebellar tonsils. And those are important because if you have some type of space-occupying lesion in the cranium, it can push the cerebellum down through the frame and magnum. And those cerebellar tonsils can push on the medulla. And the medulla, as you'll find out, is the center for respiration and, and the heart. So it could be a fatal case. But we'll talk about that more when we get up to there. But that's why I outlined the cerebellar tonsils for you. There's also something called the flocconodular lobe. You really won't see that in lab. You'll see the flocculus in the lab but you won't really see that nodulus that's indicated on this slide. But the flocconodular lobe is one of the important systems in the cerebellum that we'll talk about. This slide again just indicates the, some more of the gross external features. There's a posterior dorsal lateral or dorsal lateral fissure that separates the flocconodular lobe from the larger uh, body of the cerebellum or the corpus cerebelli. And then the primary fissure separates the anterior lobe from the posterior lobe. So these are some features that you'll probably be able to see on your uh, specimens in the lab. Now, if you look at the cerebellum microscopically, you'll see that it consists of three layers, a cerebellar cortex, cerebellar white matter, and a deep cerebellar nuclei. So you have the cerebellar cortex, which actually has three layers to it. And then just below that is the cerebellar white matter. It's white because it consists of billions of myelinated axons going into the cerebellum, coming out of the cerebellum and interconnecting the cerebellum. And then under, with, in, within the, the cerebellar white matter substance are the deep cerebellar nuclei. And we'll talk about all of those. So as I mentioned, the cerebellar cortex has three layers, which you can see on that picture. The, the most important layer for us is the middle layer called the Purkinje cell layer. It's just a single layer of cell bodies of what's known as Purkinje cells. And the Purkinje cells are important. They release GABA. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. They're the, the Purkinje cells are the only neurons that project out of the cerebellar cortex. So that cerebellar cortex in those three layers has a, a number of different types of cell types. But only the Purkinje cell types, the Purkinje cells send their axons out of the cortex. The other ones all interconnect with neurons in the cerebellar cortex. And the function of those Purkinje cells when they come out, when they send axons out of the cerebellar cortex, is the synapse on neurons in the deep cerebellar nuclei and basically inhibit them. 
As I indicated before, the cerebellar white matter consists of billions of myelinated axons. Some of them are called mossy fibers. Some of them are called climbing fibers. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then you can see within the cerebellar white matter, you have the deep cerebellar nuclei embedded in the white matter. So the cerebellum is the central coordinator of the body, but it can't do that unless it gets information into it. And it does that. One of the ways it does that, A for an input, is through these mossy fibers. And those are axons coming from what's known as the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, if you recall from the spinal cord uh, lectures and slides. And the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, which is transmitting non-conscious proprioception of the lower extremities, enters into the cerebellum through the ICP, which is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Some other afferent input into the cerebellum through these mossy fibers are what's known as the cuneocerebellar tract. And that tract is transmitting non-conscious proprioception of the upper extremities, sending that information into the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And then finally, you have vestibular nuclei, which are in the brainstem, which we get to, uh, in a, which we've already talked about, basically. And the vestibular nuclei send information into the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, and then there's these pontine nuclei located in the pons, which then send their information again into the middle cerebellar peduncle. So most of the afferent input coming into the cerebellum is through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, but there is a large amount coming in through the middle cerebellar peduncle, through those pontine nuclei which we talk about later on in this lecture. And finally, afferent input into the cerebellum occurs also by what's known as the climbing fibers. And that's simply coming from the inferior olivary nuclei. So axons coming from the inferior olivary nuclei cross the brainstem and enter into the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle and a function of the inferior olivary nucleus is to integrate proprioceptive and motor information into the cerebellum and helps contribute to smooth, coordinated movements. So if you had to give a function of the inferior olivary nucleus, that would be a function you would give, that it's, it's in part contributes to smooth, coordinated movements. And it is these mossy and climbing fibers then that form much of the cerebellar white matter. Okay, here's where we left off last time. We had talked about the three layers of the cerebellar cortex. Then we talked about the cerebellar white matter. And I had mentioned that within this cerebellar white matter are the deep cerebellar nuclei, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Okay, so these nuclei, in the nuclei, the axons of these neurons project into the brainstem either through the inferior cerebellar peduncle or through the superior cerebellar peduncles. So let's talk about these nuclei. You have the fastigial nuclei, the interposed nuclei, which is the globose and emboliform, and the dentate nuclei. The fastigial nuclei are located embedded in the white matter where the flocconodular lobe and the vermis are. So that's where those nuclei exist. The interposed nuclei, the globose and emboliform, they're 
Those nuclei are embedded in the white matter in the paravermal areas. And that's the blue you see on the diagram. You see the red vermis in the middle, and then you see the blue alongside. That's the paravermal areas. So that's where those nuclei are. And then the dentate nuclei are embedded in the white matter in the lateral hemispheres, all that green part of the cerebellum there. In the white matter, embedded in the white matter in those areas of the cerebellum is where the dentate nuclei are. Now, there's three different ways, at least, that you can describe the cerebellum. You can describe the cerebellum anatomically, phylogenically, which means how it was developed, or you can describe the cerebellum functionally. Now, if you look anatomical, phylogenically, and functionally, what you have is three different ways of describing that. The flacconodular lobe is also known, anatomically, the flacconodular lobe is also known as the archicerebellum. Archi meaning ancient, which means the flacconodular lobe was the first part of the cerebellum that was developed. So that's how it falls under the phylogenic category. And then the flacconodular lobe, or archicerebellum, forms the vestibulocerebellar system. So functionally, that anatomical area, the flacconodular lobe, is involved in what's known as the vestibulocerebellar system, which again we'll talk about in detail. The anterior lobe anatomically is part of what's known as the paleocerebellum, paleo meaning old. So it was developed after the archicerebellum. And it's part of the spinocerebellar system, which we'll talk about. And then finally, the posterior lobe forms a good part of the neocerebellum, neo meaning new, meaning the last part of the cerebellum that was formed. And that's known as functionally as the pontocerebellum. So this leads us to the most important part of the cerebellum, the cerebellar systems, the functional systems of the cerebellum. And they are the vestibulocerebellar system, the spinocerebellar system, and the ponto or neocerebellar systems. So let's start with that vestibulocerebellar system. Again, that's in the flacconodular lobe, and the outflow from the flacconodular lobe is from the vestigial uh, nuclei neurons. And they're going to project, those axons come out of the vestigial nuclei from that flacconodular lobe and project to the brainstem through the inferior cerebellar peduncle or, or through the, they're going to project out of the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And they're going to project to vestibular nuclei, which part of that is the vestibular spinal tract, so maintaining an upright position that way. And they also will project out to the reticular formation and synapse on neurons for the reticulospinal tract and eye uh, motor neurons, extraocular muscle motor neurons. So that's how this flacconodular lobe, which is the vestibular cerebellar system, how it has an effect on maintaining an upright posture because it basically activates the vestibular spinal tracts and the reticulospinal tracts, which maintain tone and extension of the body. And it's also how it projects and has an effect on the eye muscle movements. So the key here is what you see down at the bottom. A lesion at this flacconodular lobe would cause what's called truncal ataxia, with a poor sitting and standing balance, and poor visual pursuits and nystagmus. And now the spinocerebellar system, located again in the vermis 
and in the paravermal area. So all that you see outlined on that slide, that's where the spinal cerebellar system is from. So the bottom line here with the spinal cerebellar system is it controls muscle tone and synergy of contracting muscles. So a little bit more complex coordinated movements. And if you have a lesion here, it would cause lower extremity and gait ataxia, dysarthria, and dysmetria. So what you want to ask yourself is why would it cause that? So it would cause ataxia because you do not have that control and synergy of your contracting muscles. It would cause dysarthria for the same thing. You don't have the coordination that you need for the throat musculature. And dysmetria, which is like trying to put two fingertips together, you would like that because, again, that proprioceptive input is not normal. And so you're having a difficult time figuring out where you're at because you don't have control of tone and synergy of those muscles. And then finally, the most complex part of the cerebellum in terms of coordination is the ponto or neocerebellar system. And it's receiving information through the middle cerebellar peduncle. So the dentate nuclei, which are the main nuclei of the ponto cerebellar system, are receiving input to them through the middle cerebellar peduncle from what I had mentioned before, pontine nuclei. Nuclei that are just scattered around in that basilar pons send their axons through the middle cerebellar peduncle into these dentate nuclei residing in the lateral hemispheres. And then those dentate nuclei project through the superior cerebellar peduncle to the motor thalamus and then to the motor cortex. So that's the first half of what's called the feed-forward control system, how the cerebellum and the motor cortex communicate with each other to eventually result in a smooth coordinated movement. The motor cortex intended movement, that information is getting transmitted into the cerebellum through that pathway, ponto, pontine nuclei, middle cerebellar peduncle into the dentate nuclei. And then the dentate nuclei project out of the cerebellum through that dentato rubrothalamal tract to the thalamus and to the motor cortex. So the cerebellum is communicating to the cortex. This is where the body position is right now. Here's the position of all the joints. Okay. And the, and the motor cortex is telling the cerebellum what the intended movement is, and that's how then the cerebellum will make the corrections necessary so that a smooth coordinated movement occurs. And obviously, if you have a lesion in your big lateral hemispheres, a lot of damage there, you would have a loss of fine movement coordination skills. So how do these three systems work together? The vestibular cerebellar system, the spinal cerebellar system, and the ponto cerebellar system. Well, this slide shows you if someone were to reach into a cabinet, a cabinet to grab like a cup, the vestibular cerebellar system is involved in maintaining an upright balance so that you can stand there and do that. The spinal cerebellar system is directing the, the hand to the cup. And then the ponto cerebellar system is actually manipulating the hand, fine motor control to grasp the cup. So that's how the three systems can work together in doing a, basically a simple activity. So let's talk briefly about the blood supply. You have the pica, uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and the superior cerebellar arteries, all supplying different areas of the cerebellum. Now, how about some overall characteristic signs and symptoms of cerebellar lesions? Well, one of them is hypotonia. Of course, hypotonia is not specific for a cerebellar lesion. 
You can have that with spinal cord injuries and strokes, but hypotonia could be with a cerebellar injury. And it's thought that because of impaired activity of the reticular spinal tracts, which innervate your gamma motor neurons and, and uh, are involved in maintaining regular muscle tone, is not working properly. So that might be causing the hypotonia. Ataxia, the uncoordinated gait we already talked about. Dysmetria and pass pointing. Pass pointing is like if you were trying to point your finger to somebody else's nose and you end up overshooting it and, and hitting them in the eye with your finger. And then all of that's because of impaired proprioception. Another cerebellar uh, disorder characteristic sign is what's called intention or action tremors. When they go to reach for something, the hand shakes a lot. And it's not that it's not really a tremor, but it's shaking as it's try it's basically going side to side and up and down the hand is in order to try to find the object because with a cerebellar lesion, they don't really know where their body part is in space. Dysarthria, we talked about asthenia is a a general term that means weakness, possibly again due to the reticular spinal tract activity not being normal. Asthenia you've heard before with myasthenia gravis. And then nystagmus again, which is that rapid uh, rapid movement of the eyes one direction and or slow to one direction and fast to another direction. Again, you, you wouldn't normally have that, but if you have a cerebellar problem, you could have that. Some other signs and symptoms, rebound phenomena, uh, because again, they don't have the good proprioceptive input. So if you're manually muscle testing elbow flexion and you release it normally, the arm just, the forearm stays there. But if you have a cerebellar disorder, when you release it, they may slap themselves in the face because they don't really have that control. Decomposition of, of movement. Uh, where you're breaking up the movement into individual parts to finally get to that cup. So in other words, the arm is, the hand's moving all over the place to, instead of going to a straight line to a cup because they don't really know where they're at in space. Pendular reflexes, you do a patellar tendon reflex, and instead of it kicking up once and then stopping, it just keeps going like a pendulum. Again, it could be uh, tone problems causing that. Titubation or to totter staggering gait with a shaking head and trunk. And then the one at the top, this diadococinesia is one that you typically see on exams. And that's the inability to perform rapid alternating movement. In other words, supination, pronation really rapidly, they kind of lose coordination with that because they don't really know where they're at in space very well. And there is something called cerebellar ataxia. Of course, you can have somatosensory ataxia, vestibular ataxia as well. With somatosensory ataxia, you'd have better balance with the eyes open because you can use your vision to maintain your balance better. With vestibular ataxia, it's more gravity dependent. So movements are normal when you're lying down and you're not, your head's not in an upright position. And they have better balance with the eyes open as well, but they have vertigo and nystagmus, whereas somatosensory ataxia, they wouldn't. With cerebellar ataxia, they are unable to stand with their feet together, and it, with, whether their eyes are open or closed, it doesn't matter, because even if they have that input, they're not able to coordinate that movement. Remember, the cerebellum is your main coordinating center. So even if the other senses are fine, if you can't coordinate vision and somatosensory and vestibular, then you're going to have problems with balance and ataxia. So they're unstable, even if the visual and vestibular and somatosensory systems are, are normal. 